That was a mesmerizing uh, oration, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Really enjoyed it, and it's a very hard act to follow for me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Sunil Narayanath from Bangalore Apollo Hospitals, and I am sorry to be a space-occupying lesion between you and your lunch. I'll try and be as brief as possible. I have been chosen to speak to you on vestibular implants. How and why? And the very first question I asked was, why me? I haven't got the foggiest idea, but then I've tried to justify this. I have been Dr. Ravi Nair's student <laughs> from St. John's Medical College. Ten points for that, I'm sure. Uh, I have sat through the Vertigo clinics and ready patients for Dr. Kirtane's uh, Vertigo clinics in uh, Mumbai during my MS days for three years without loss of enthusiasm. I have done two fellowships uh, towards the end of my training in the UK. I did a neurotology fellowship with Richard Irving and then with uh, John Rutka, again a very big name from uh, Toronto. So I was happy to note uh, there was a reference to Toronto in uh, Dr. Mahmoud's lecture. So, so I guess that's one reason. The other reason is I've gone on these huge, tallest buildings in the world, and, and I'm sure some of you have also, and to experience that physiological vertigo of the extreme variety, you have to be on those glass floors. Um, I think I've done that, and some of you have done that too. And I think the final slide on my justification for this lecture is, is that I have been associated with cochlear implants since 1995 when I went to, uh, to the UK. And I have been a clinical and surgical support for uh, Medel, Cochlear and Advanced Bionics, of which Medel and Cochlear have been involved in uh, vestibular implants. So I guess uh, I could talk a little bit, at least I could contact them to give me some information. So all that I'm going to talk to you right now would be not from my experience, would be from what I have put together, what I have gathered from not just these companies, but also the teams involved in this kind of research. So that's the skeleton of my uh, talk. Uh, I will probably spend five minutes into these five limbs, the introduction, the concept, the journey so far, ongoing research, and what challenges and scope do we have for future research. Now, uh, we are all lucky to have evolved in our balance systems. And I was pleased to hear uh, that uh, that balance is the primary function of, of the years. And uh, I don't know, I could argue both ways there. In a cochlear implant conference, I would say hearing this. But, uh, but definitely balance is a prime function of the inner ears. And, and, and this is proof of how the inner ears speak to every other system involved in, in balance function. And we are all aware of how we have evolved from a quadrupedal stage to a bipedal stage. And, and the inner ears are of prime importance in our vestibular uh, uh, inputs and hence balance harmony. So the physiology of balance, I'm sure, has been dis discussed this morning and we are all aware that there are these three systems that speak to each other and connect with the, the work hearts, the workstation, the cerebellum. And then there are these uh, vestibular pathways and reflexes. Now, the, and then as uh, ENT surgeons and uh, allied, we are involved in the study of the vestibular system, in, which in my opinion is the most important input to uh, balance in the body. And also, I'm quite uh, chuffed to, to, to see that God created this little organ just inside the ear, just inside the eardrum, uh, that he put hearing and balance together because you can not separate music from dance. So you have to have hearing and balance together. 
postural stability is from these three inputs. Repetition for the sake of emphasis, two vestibular imp uh, inputs, uh, labyrinthine inputs, binocular vision, and the proprioceptive system. And then the, I think this is the most complex sensory motor organ system in the body because there are these four pathways and their interconnections and then they have to talk to each other. Now, I don't know why this is not called a special sense organ. When you talk of special sense organs, you talk about vision, uh, hearing, taste, smell and skin. Why is balance not a special sense organ? I think it is. And it is the most complex of the special sense organs that we have. And it is, in fact, an organ system. Just a thought there. Uh, and then, what is, what is in these th amongst these three inputs, which of the three inputs is the most important one? And, and you're all ENTs here. Uh, so you would say the ears are most important. So this is a bank robbery, uh, a single man team. Look at how uh, uh, effective his balance system is, and he, he, it's got, he's got this learned behavior as well, working on his uh, jump struts. And he's escaped from the police, he's gone to his flat, and he's opening to look at the loot, and he's rejoicing. Only for that to happen. Bad end. So what went wrong? What system failed him here? I think the very obvious answer here is his eyes failed him. Well, that's not true. I think all three systems didn't talk to each other. And hence, that uh, end result. So let's move on now from introduction to why vestibular implants. So this is the concept. Imagine a patient whose daily living is like this. He wakes up in the morning and the whole day goes on like this. That is scary. Now, we do not have easy answers to treat these patients. We don't have a cure yet. So this is a patient with bilateral vestibular loss. This is a patient with chronic imbalance, with blurring of vision in dynamic conditions. And that's called oscillopsia. So you know what oscillopsia is with frequent falls, difficulty, reading signs. So daily living is is a mess is a nightmare for these patients and and they're often misconstrued as uh, being drunk it cannot be compensated fully bilateral vestibular loss sensory substitution is insufficient and there is no effective medical treatment i'm sure we'll keep discussing the uh, treatment options in these patients and hence the concept of a vestibular implant to artificially restore vestibular function similar to that of a cochlear implant. So who needs a vestibular implant? A patient with bilateral vestibulopathy, with oscillopsia, chronic disequilibrium, postural instability, and impaired spatial orientation. And it's, it's quite rampantly prevalent. And I was surprised to see almost one out of a thousand people uh, suffers from bilateral vestibular loss. One out of a thousand with uh, with the dizziness. So, what is oscillopsia? And I'm sure some of you uh, are not very sure of what oscillopsia is, and this is exactly what it is. And, and that video I showed you right in the beginning is exactly what oscillopsia is. And how do you test oscillopsia? The easiest way to test is this. If you don't have a Snellen's chart in your Vertigo clinic, I think you should have one. So I was surprised to see a Snellen's chart in Birmingham and then in Toronto. Uh, what's a Snellen's chart doing in, in an ENT clinic? Uh, and this is exactly why we use it. it it's it's a, the simplest clinical test of dynamic visual acuity. So if with corrected vision about two feet away, I think, you can read all the lines till the last line. And then when you start moving your head right to left as quickly as possible, so this is like your head shake test, you do the head shaking, and if you miss more than four lines from below, you're most likely suffering from oscillopsia or bilateral vestibular loss, typically seen in all those patients with uh, autotoxicity. John Rutka in uh, Toronto 
treated half the population of Canada uh, with autotoxic uh, bilateral vestibular loss, and I, I had the opportunity to work with him. So that's the concept. The concept is to, to create external components and internal implants that will mimic and correct uh, the insufficient vestibular function. So how do you do that? The external components include motion sensors, which are gyroscopes, and that is processed into, so the balance inputs are processed into electrical currents by an external processor, like the speech processor in a cochlear implant. This is wirelessly transmitted, so magnetic connections between the external processor transmitter coil, internal uh, receiver stimulator package, the wirelessly uh, transmitted uh, signals, can't call it sounds, signals are then transferred to the vestibular electrodes. Electrically, these would stimulate the vestibular nerves. And that stimulus is interpreted as head motion by the brain. This is the concept of a vestibular vestibular implant. And I was telling you how the vestibular implant is more, uh, the vestibular system is, is a more uh, complex system than the hearing system. Auditory uh, systems are easy to duplicate. Um, in that, if there is a picture coming up, it would be great. In that, all that you have to do is get that tonotopic uh, uh, possibility duplicated within the cochlea. So right from high frequencies in the basal turn to the low frequencies in the apical turn. And you put in an electrode, have set number of uh, channels and you can stimulate. Actually, that's much simpler technology than trying to mimic the vestibular system. So, so that is a cochlear implant and, and that challenge well, that knowledge, rather, has been used to stimulate the vestibular system as well. Okay, so, so the challenge, like I said, so that's a cochlear implant, and that, that is easily doable. Now, to mimic something similar with so many end organs, you know, like the organ of corti along the basilar membrane is, is so different from, from so many end organs that we have for the peripheral vestibular system. So that's, that's a serious challenge. So let's look at some basics here. So this is a vestibular ocular reflex. We know what the VOR is at rest, baseline activity on both sides. When you move your head to the right, there's eye movement to the left. So, so the side that the head is moving is excited. The other side is inhibited. So that's the normal VOR. Now, if there is right vestibular hypofunction, if you're moving your head to the right, there is an uncompensated right vestibular hypofunction. So the eyes should have moved to the other side, but they move to the same side. So that's an uncompensated right vestibular hypofunction. So what should an implant do? The implant should stimulate or compensate for this hypofunction like it would do here. So if we can compensate and make sure when the head is moving to the right, the eyes move to the left, and then there is a central compensatory mechanism to correct the eye movement. And that's exactly what we want to achieve with the vestibular implant. There will be uh, an initial period of uh, nystagmus with the on, with the switch on, but then very quickly patients habituate to that. Now, what is also important is that there is a requirement for a certain level of residual, residual vestibular activity. And with that, working with that, you need to bring it up to baseline level. So there is adaptation and habituation to this electrically stimulated baseline. This is like the first map that you would have with a cochlear implant. So the first map is your basic neural response telemetry map, and that would be the electrical baseline for this patient. Following that, you start modulating it. You would start modulating for, for every uh, movement 
head turned to the right or head turned to the left. You want to be able to stimulate one side and hence obtain an inhibitory response on the other side. So, so, so the, the brain has to understand that there should be no adaptation to motion modulated stimulation. So there's always a, a baseline activity, electrical baseline activity, which takes care of the VOR. And then when there is, when there is movement, because there is hypofunction, you want to switch on. So you can program various programs like we do with a cochlear implant, a P1, P2, P3, P4. So that there are programs that you can choose that will help you with that movement perception and hence all the compensatory mechanisms for the same to keep your balance in place. So that's essentially what a vestibular implant would do. Motion modulated stimulation is again something uh, which is very individualistic. And with cochlear implants, some kids pick up very quickly hearing. Some kids take their time, and it is essentially the same with this also. So that's, that's the ongoing uh, clinical trials and research. So programming is something that they do repeatedly on and off and off and on uh, uh, states. And then that dual state adaptation with unilateral vestibular stimulation in a case of bilateral vestibular loss is what we are researching. So here's a prototype vestibular implant. And these are the components. There's an electrical stimulator with three extracochlear electrodes placed into the ampullae of each of the semicircular canals. There's also an intracochlear array. What do you want that for? Or should there be a hearing loss in this patient, you should be able to stimulate the cochlea as well for the hearing. And there is a ground electrode uh, on the receiver stimulator package, which we call a ECAP ground electrode. Two approaches, intralabyrinthine and uh, uh, extralabyrinthine. So intralabyrinthine is the one that we would uh, prefer to use because uh, it's, it's something that we are all very familiar with, and I'll tell you about the extralabyrinthine. So, so the consideration is to be cl as close to the vestibular nerves to give selective stimulation with very little spread to other nerves around, especially the facial, and definitely not the cochlear, and with very few surgical risks. And, and this is how it's done. I tried to get a video of that. I wrote to some of these uh, uh, the researchers. They wouldn't share. So, uh, so this is all I, I have for you. So you do essentially a cortical mastoidectomy, posterior tympanotomy, expose the semicircular canals like you would do in a labyrinthectomy, blue line them, and then make a fenestration at the junction of the thin segment and the ampulla. So just at their ampullary ends, would you open up and then insert the electrodes? And I think I have a better picture here. This is from Medel, uh, thanks to them. So this is essentially what you do. So you do a posterior tympanotomy, a cortical mastoidectomy, uh, blue line, the labyrinth, and then open up the ampullae. You know, the two ampullae of the superior and the lateral canals are together. And the posterior ampullary uh, end is uh, just under the facial nerve, correct? So, so you want it you want that opened up and then the electrodes inserted there. There's also an intracochlear uh, uh, electrode. So, so that is the lateral canal, that is the superior canal. Then this is the, this is temperamental. This is the, the middle picture is, is the posterior canal. And then yeah, the multi-channel one is the intracochlear electrode. There is an extra labyrinthine approach as well. Uh, like we used to do a uh, singular uh, neurectomy, you can approach the posterior ampullary nerve through the transmetal uh, approach through the round window niche, and then uh, approach the lateral and the superior ampullary nerves, again, knocking off the heads uh, of the malleus and the incus and reaching them that way. But this has been tried in just a couple of patients and they've found it uh, very unreliable in uh, correct placements. So, so the other approach that I showed you is exactly what they are doing. Vestibular implant uh, research has been there from 1963. So that's as old as cochlear implant research. But why is it that we have not uh, really got any major uh, breakthroughs or earth-shattering uh, breakthroughs here? God only knows. I think there are not many takers for uh, for, the, for this uh, disability 
uh, in terms of research and research grants as there have been for deafness. So Cohen and Suzuki have been working on this for more than uh, four decades and only recently have we had, uh, a decade ago, we've had some uh, uh, breakthroughs. Um, very quickly, uh, some slides on what has been the journey so far. Um, there are several teams, but the European team between Maastricht and Geneva have done really well. They first started off with a single implant just into the uh, posterior ampullary nerve, and they were, uh, they were able to continuously stimulate electrically and get that adaptation phase that I was talking to you about on that patient. And then they extended that to a multi, uh, multi ampullary stimulation. And uh, in about 11 patients, they published this as recently as 2015, eight years of experience. This is again the European trial with the Medel uh, device. And they were able to uh, look at the axis of the response, which was consistent with the stimulated nerve branch in at least 17 out of the 24 tested uh, electrodes. So electrical stimulation is definitely safe and effective to activate the vestibular system is what they came up with. And this is their most uh, recent uh, publication with 15 years of experience with the vestibular implant. And uh, there, they're very clearly saying, um, 13 patients, very clearly they were able to generate bidirectional vestibular reflexes with a unilateral pr pr prosthesis in patients with bilateral vestibular la loss. And there was always an artificial baseline activity required with these patients from the time the patient wakes up in the morning till he, she goes to bed in the evening. And, and the adaptation can happen in less than 30 minutes at the time of uh, switch on. So ongoing research, there are four teams. There's uh, a Washington team with Jay Rubinstein, a good friend of mine, but he wouldn't share any information. I emailed him when Srinivas gave me this uh, lecture, wouldn't share. Johns Hopkins teams, uh, I, I can share a few slides with you. Della Santina is doing uh, tremendous work, again, with the Medel device. Howard, I think, is a nucleus device. Uh, Jay Rubinstein is uh, Washington, is also a nucleus device. Um, Howard's, I still don't have any information on. The European team with uh, Kingma and uh, Goyot, I have discussed all their experience uh, in the previous slides. So, so at the moment, a, an open clinical trial that is happening where they're actively recruiting patients, volunteers, for this vestibular implant is at Johns Hopkins in um, Baltimore. And this is the device that they have a little different Again, a metal device, but a little different from the European device in that they have uh, three magnets here. They also have a re separate reference electrode in addition to the ECAP uh, reference electrode. Everything else remains the same. I have no idea why they need so many magnets. And uh, they put this all up on the website, and I can share that with you. And uh, there are some certain specific criteria for inclusion, and there are criteria for exclusion. For example, you don't want patients with tumors, you don't want patients with infections of the middle ear, labyrinthine injury for various other reasons. So essentially, this should be a patient with bilateral vestibular loss with nothing else life-threatening. It should not be a patient with active Meniere's disease. Again, it is so difficult to, to modulate uh, the vestibular responses in an active Meniere's disease also. So I think uh, the patient numbers would uh, desperately fall for their uh, trials because of these uh, requirements. So four subjects have been implanted uh, by Johns Hopkins so far. Uh, these are the hearing results of these patients, and uh, that's not too bad. There's some, some hearing loss post-implantation, but uh, it's not uh, uh, detrimental. It's definitely serviceable. So useful hearing was preserved in all these patients, and it did not affect uh, hearing thresholds. And as far as balance was concerned, all patients reported improvement in, the, in their oscillopsia. All reported less unsteadiness, improvement in posture and gait and reduced uh, dizziness handicap. So these are the patients. Two of them did very well post-activation itself, but one took a little longer uh, to respond better. 
So the status is that all subjects wear their system 24 hours a day, well, until they go to sleep. And I think it is kept switched on even even in sleep because uh, you know not your hearing doesn't uh, sleep, your balance doesn't sleep. So so this is on uh, even uh, during their sleep because when you turn your head left to right, I think that input is important for that baseline electrical activity. So. What's the challenge for the future? We need to make sure it doesn't spread anywhere else, so there shouldn't be hearing loss, there shouldn't be facial stimulation. They're still tweaking all the parameters. For example, shortening the pulse duration may be a good idea. They're also looking at infrared uh, uh, technology uh, incorporating into this. Uh, we can talk about that later. So basically, we need a device that can both excite head motion in one direction and inhibit movement in the opposite direction. I don't think we have cracked that yet. So in summary, in summary, so this is the most uh, complex, that's not playing, this is the most complex uh, organ system uh, to duplicate function. It's not going to be so easy. Research grants leave a lot to be desired. I told you that because I don't think balance is taken as seriously as deafness is. And again, deafness is not taken as seriously as blindness or cancer or heart disease. Research and development has very slow progress. Human clinical trials are ongoing, but there are so many variables like uh, it has been discussed in this conference. And, and, and it is such a complex uh, organ system. 15 years experience so far has been encouraging. But if you ask me, I think it will take at least another decade before we have a commercial vegetable implant available. Thank you very much for your patience.